Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this digital session. I know digital has been coming up as a theme all the way through the conference, but we're going to focus particularly today on EdTech and how it's serving the digital natives that are all our students that we're all serving out there. So how, how best to engage them, enable them, and empower them. I've got a fantastic lineup of presenters here in front of me, Jeanette Chia, I've got um, Akash Saxena, Sunil Acharya, and Nick Hutton as well. So we're going to get each of them to speak for six or seven minutes. Um, we'll then go into a small panel discussion. I'll keep that pretty short because I think throwing it over to questions from you will get the most interaction um, out of the session. But it's as wide as that. How, how is EdTech going to best serve the digital natives out there? So Jeanette, let's start with you if we could. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Jeanette Chia, CEO and co-founder of a company called Hex. We work with universities and high schools around the world to deliver entrepreneurship and innovation training. And uh, I would consider myself to be actually one of these digital natives that we are talking about. And I would consider every single one of our students also to be a digital native that we work with. Um, probably to give you some context and to explain my experience here is that my business started as a study abroad company. We made all of our revenue from flying students around the world and educating them on entrepreneurship. And the minute the borders closed, my revenue went to absolute zero. So if anyone had, can tell you about translating offline experiences to online experiences, it's definitely my team and I over in Australia. And uh, one of the things that we were really excited about, but also struggled with, and I'm sure many of us here did, is how do you bring that excitement of being in a physical place with your collaborators into the digital space? Um, we went about this in a few different ways. One was to think about, you know, what is our role as almost media TV presenters? If you're delivering your digital content, the energy you have to project on your side of the screen is about three times the level of which the student's going to experience it on the other side. We've also embraced the concept of semi-synchronous rather than purely async or uh, synchronous learning. So we think semi-synchronous means that students will get a chance to do some learning at their own pace while also having in real time engagement with their peers, also their mentors and tutors. Uh, and really excitingly, I think, is we've engaged our digital natives and our Generation Z students to help us co-design programs and courses. What's really, fan like, what's really fascinating is this generation is already experiencing the best possible technology that they could experience. Their expectations are so high, they're sky high. They, they will log on to an LMS or they'll log on to a learning system or to any kind of device expecting it to deliver the same seamless, fun, engaging experience that they'll get on any other platform. And I think one of the opportunities for the education sector is to really think about how we can also serve their needs and their expectations, working with the generation where a 15 second video is too long for them. I'm sure many of you will have children or students who are in that space where they'll keep scrolling, they'll keep scrolling. How do we keep them engaged uh, in this kind of space. So I think it's a real opportunity for educators to think about supplementing what we do in the classroom or what we do online with the kinds of experiences that students are getting already. Um, and to do this, as I said before, the collaboration and the co-design opportunity is really exciting. So we bring in experts from companies like Atlassian, so uh, large tech companies, and then we combine it with the academic uh, piece for universities around the world. And then the third part of the puzzle is actually the students. We will not release a single piece of content unless it's actually been approved by all three or it's been co-designed by all three. So for us, this is a really exciting opportunity to bring the Generation Zs, the digital natives, into the co-design process and also, while doing this, set them up with the skills that they need to work in the future economy. I think that EdTech's got a really awesome opportunity to actually become not just a delivery system, but also the kind of thing that can train students in how to use digital as they step into the workforce. It's really important for us to mirror industry tools in our education process. For example, students are already using Discord in their day-to-day -day social lives, and most companies are using Slack, like a lot of tech companies are using Slack to work. Why would you not embed a, a technology such as Slack into your education delivery so that students can actually learn how to be great uh, economic contributors the minute they step out of education. 
And when it comes to teachers and educators, I think the, the question of whether EdTech is supplementary or complementary really comes down to complementary, right? I think that it is completely unfair to expect our educators with everything else that they've got on their plates to also become right up to date with the changes that AWS did yesterday or the changes that have come through on different platforms. It's not possible. You have enough to do. So I would love to see greater interaction between the technology world and also the education world so that teachers' uh, expertise or educators' expertise is supplemented by um, industry folk who can also build and crowdsource this, this information. So I think that there's lots there that I covered. I think I've hit my time, probably. Perfect. That was um, breakneck speed. Breakneck speed. Uh, and uh, yeah, really excited to continue the chat. Thank you for having and, me. And probably three times the energy that you would have face to face in the classroom. I this know. Is all, this is almost like Zoom. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Fantastic. just uh, picture on through a screen. Thanks, Jeanette. So I'm going to um, pass over now to Sunil from AWS um, to, to speak to this theme too. Yeah, you, you don't realize how long 10 minutes really is. It just never got. <laughs> okay, so I'm Sunil. I, I'm from Amazon Web Services. I, I'm going to assume you know what Amazon Web Services is, but it is the cloud. So, uh, and I run the education and a bunch of other segments uh, for India and South Asia. Uh, just from a quick context setting perspective, if you use Netflix, that's on the cloud, that's on AWS, and you've experienced AWS already, okay? So Uber is on AWS, just from an example perspective, right? Uh, education has, I mean, the, all industries that we work with right now has changed over the last two years. I think the pandemic primarily accelerated a lot of digitization that happened across industries. And I manage uh, a bunch of other segments besides education. I look after nonprofits, skilling, et cetera. And we've seen that entire sea change across all these segments. Okay, and this is primarily because the last two years, uh, because of not having contact, people had to move to the cloud to try and make sure nonprofits are able to raise money for their activities remotely and also be able to transform and share updates on progress on the spend of money, for example. So we saw that change happening. Education had a massive, massive change, okay? It's a pet subject of mine. I can talk on that. So education saw significant change with regard to remote learning happening. We got your Zoom and everything else happening at a very accelerated pace. We also saw higher education institutions move to virtual classrooms and virtual labs which was nothing that 2019, it was available, nobody used it. But last two years, we saw that taking off. In fact, we have somebody in the stall at the exhibition called Nova Pro Labs, who's got about 28,000 virtual labs running at any point of time. Okay, and that's something that you should look at, uh, exampling and seeing how that works out. So we saw that taking off. Uh, over the last two years, we also saw government adopting technology in a very interesting fashion. I'm sure all of you all have used Coven and Arugya Setu, I'm sure you have. If you haven't, please put your hand up. But you have, but I'm sure that's primarily what is on the cloud. So it is built entirely on the cloud. And you've seen that over uh, 200 million people, two crore, uh, uh, 200 crore people actually used uh, the platform right now. That's how scalable it is. So we've seen the change happening across industries, education, government, healthcare, We've seen a massive change in remote healthcare taking off in a big way. And one of the examples I keep talking about is that we had a, a big conference in India last week called the AWS Summit, and we had delegates from the US coming in. And one of the delegates had a slight eye infection, and he wanted to see a doctor. He was moving from Gurgaon to Delhi. And he did a teleconsultation on the, in the car, got a prescription in the car, stopped at a medical shop, got the medicines, all in 45 minutes. So the next day at breakfast, he tells me that that would have taken him five hours in the US. So India has leapfrogged with technology adoption around a lot of different things, right? So, and, that, and that, those are examples that we keep seeing across industries. Healthcare is a great example. Education is no less. The edtech industry, in spite of all the negative news happening, I still believe it's, it's an investment, uh, it's an industry that's gonna be taking off. Uh, we have about, 400 million students in the education ecosystem, 55,000 higher education uh, institutions. We are the largest education ecosystem in the world. Okay, and I think the edtech industry as we talk today is still very, very early. We really haven't reached a stage where we're thinking of uh, people going down and shutting down. Layoffs and profits and loss will continue, but I think that business is gonna take off in a big way. And the reason for that, unlike other industries, other countries, Indian education is a very layered education model. 
You have a test prep ecosystem. You have the entire ecosystem running there, the tuition eco ecosystem that is there. And you have so many different layers of education happening in the country, and EdTech will always find reasons and opportunities for them to build and grow. And we're seeing that happening, right? In spite of all uh, the top end of EdTech is getting a lot of negative news around layoffs and stuff like that, I think the positivity really is around the fact that the opportunity to grow and scale is so much larger. Okay, and I think that's going to continue to grow. And if you look at the new education policy that is driving a lot of digital usage in the classroom, okay, local language learning, those are areas of big improvement we're going to see over the next couple of years. So all in all, I think, I think from an AWS perspective, we have a fairly good view over the last couple of years around how the market's changed and how the market's going to be changing over the next couple of years. So I think if you're in the education business, if you're looking at an institution business, I think the opportunity for India is significantly great as we look forward right now. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Sunil. Um, we're going to hand now to um, Nick, Nick Hutton, who's from DTL, D2L, sorry. Thanks all. Good uh, morning, everybody, or should I say good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to... Uh, to speak and uh, share some thoughts uh, today. Uh, yes, my name is Nick Hutton. I'm the regional uh, director for Asia for D2L. Um, I'm based in Singapore, as it happens. And uh, just to give you a, a kind of a two-second brief on D2L, if you don't know who we are. Uh, D2L, we, we used to be called Desire to Learn, is a company based in Canada that was founded 23 years ago. Uh, we produce a learning management system called Brightspace. Um, we, uh, we are recognized, I think, globally as the number one learning management system for next generation teaching and learning. We have uh, about 15 to 20 million uh, learners on our platform at the moment. Uh, interestingly enough, exclusively through my friend here on the right. So we work very closely together with AWS uh, and they're a great partner. Um, I think if we get down to the the subject in hand or the topic in hand, talking about uh, empowering, uh, engaging, and enabling digital natives, uh, I think it's important to understand that when you're talking about education technology as a platform for delivering teaching and learning um, in whatever sector, but let's look at higher education as an example, then it's incredibly important to understand that one size does not fit all. What every faculty member, whatever t every teacher will tell you is that the journey is individual for every single student and every single learner. And it is incredibly important in doing that if you're using education technology to enhance and support your teaching and learning, it's incredibly important to make sure that the, uh, the way in which you deliver that is both engaging and, of course, personalized. Uh, and to do that, it's important to understand what you need within your educational technology platform. You know, we know that all students are digital natives. We know that their ability to use technology has been enhanced over the last couple of years, but you know, if you look back to where that came from, um, and those of you who know anything about Apple will remember, maybe, that in 2007, Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. My colleague here from Samsung on the left has got a series of products that are as good, if not better, than the iPhone. I'm only saying that because I'm sitting here, by the way. Um, so, so if you think about that, undergraduate students today have only ever known those kinds of devices. Uh, and that's exactly what they intend and expect to learn of. So we, we, we mustn't forget that their expectation in learning is going to be the same as the way they use every other app on that digital device. So if you're an education technology provider, as we are, you have to make sure that that experience is the same or better. And there's a number of things that kind of feed into that. I mean, the first is, obviously, the technology has to be mobile. But it's not only mobile. It has to be mobile to the extent that it's completely responsive to the device you're using. 
Uh, and for those of you who have used learning management systems of any kind, maybe as a teacher, maybe as a learner, maybe as an administrator, you'll know that they're, they're pretty deep in terms of the feature sets that they have. Ours, 23 years of developing features uh, on uh, one platform means that the richness of our features are incredibly deep. Now, to, to make sure that those features and then that richness gets transferred, you've got to make sure that the platform is web responsive, as we call it, and that there's a great app that goes with it. So a combination of the two things. So learning any time from any place or in any place becomes a key component of, uh, of the digital platform itself. The other area that I think is, uh, I mean, it goes without saying that the technology has to be worry-free, right? Absolutely worry-free. And, and, the, and the way in which it's used, and, and I'm, I'm talking here both from, a, from a, a teacher's perspective as well as a learner's perspective, let's not forget that when you're using digital technology to deliver teaching and learning, actually the most important user is the teacher or the faculty. Because if they don't understand the value, and Jeanette mentioned complementary, not supplementary, so if they don't understand the value of the technology to support their teaching and learning, and they don't adopt it, then obviously the students aren't going to use it. And then the, the, the fact that the institution has chosen that particular digital technology platform uh, is redundant. So usability. The graphical user interface, it sounds cliched and it sounds old fashioned, but it's the reality, is absolutely critical in all of that usability, both at the student's level and also at the teacher's level. The other area I think that, that people tend to overlook a little bit uh, when using digital platforms or, or delivering off digital platforms is the whole area of what I would call equity for all learners or equity for all students. And that's around accessibility and inclusion. You know, if you're a teacher and you've got a class of 40 students, you've got all different types of students in, the, in that class. And it's very important to make sure that whatever you're using to support, complement, enhance your teaching and learning is accessible to all of those students. Very, very important indeed. So accessibility and uh, inclusion is a, is a critical part of it. I think um, uh, in addition to that, if you talk about engagement, um, enablement, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, the way in which a student would use a platform, we mustn't forget the teacher and enabling the teacher to be able to use the platform as best and as well as they can. Uh, and part of that is you know, being able to build their content uh, easily and well, being able to add the pedagogical styles and the tools that they use normally in delivery face-to-face -to, -face to that particular course, and then making sure that not only does it enhance their teaching and learning, but it makes them a better teacher uh, by using the technology correctly. So I think enablement uh, of, the, of the faculty or the teachers is the, is the piece that maybe is missing here. We're focusing on students, we're focusing on, on the learners, but let's not forget uh, the, uh, the faculty and the importance of the faculty in that whole, uh, that whole journey. So, personalized learning, creating the right learning path, getting to the right outcome. NEP talks about OBE, outcome-based education, competency-based education. Those are all things that create the engagement level, but more importantly, put you in a position where you can get to the right outcome and the best outcome for learners and students in today's uh, digital environment. Thank you Thank very you much, so. Nick. Terrific. Um, so our last um, speaker is Akash Saxena from Sam Samsung. Akash. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I run the Samsung just, Enterprise Just hold your business. mic a bit close to your mouth. Okay. Fantastic. I run the Samsung Enterprise business for Southwest Asia, and it's a pleasure to be out here today sharing our insights into how Samsung is enabling the education vertical and working very closely with the entire ecosystem. So if you look at uh, out here, this is the entire ecosystem out here that Samsung works very closely with. 
so we work very closely with uh, the companies uh, which are into software, which are into hardware, which are into cloud. And the whole objective is to make sure that the overall learning experience on the devices is phenomenal. So if you look at the last uh, two years, they have been a game changer. It, they have been a life changer for most of us. And uh, Samsung has been investing a lot into R&D to make sure that we are continuously working on our devices all across. So when I talk about devices, we are not just talking about the mobility devices, but we are also talking about the interactive uh, display boards, which provide a fantastic classroom learning experience. So Samsung works with the mobility devices, with the, uh, the display boards of different sizes that we are able to provide in the classroom. And if you look at, uh, uh, our friends spoke about uh, a lot of things on what is happening on AI or machine learning, the kind of experience that people get is really phenomenal using the technology which is there today. But frankly, I personally am of the opinion and we believe that uh, all the technology which is coming in is actually complementary and it can never replace the physical stuff which is happening. And that's why if you look at in the last two years, the physical education was there, online was there, but it was a privilege that was available only to, I would say, a lot of uh, students in the metro cities, they had access to all the stuff which was there. But uh, because COVID happened and government also realized that uh, a lot of students in uh, villages have, do not have access to, the schools are not opening, they do not have access to the digital education, they do not have access to the internet. Hence, uh, Samsung has also worked a lot with uh, governments across various states to make sure that we are continuously uh, providing these devices, working with government to the students in the villages, as a result of which today, uh, even in the rural India, the penetration of internet and the penetration of devices that government of India has been distributing is really uh, bringing a major change on the fundamentals which is happening which is the basics where the students who do not have any access today have access to internet and that's a true game changer. Now if you look at uh, uh, education as such, there are multiple things uh, that Samsung does by providing the solution. So I would urge all of you to do visit our stall which is there where we have provided a whole lot of these uh, solutions on display and you all can visit those and see that. And we are continuously investing, working with our R&D teams to make sure that the overall experience is phenomenal. Now today, if you look at, just to give you a small example, the amount of time that students spend today on the digital devices also is not very good for eyes. Now Samsung has been working on to make sure that all the displays that go on our devices, there are technologies available where the strain on the eyes is as less as possible. So we are continuously working and all these investments that you're doing is resulting into an overall fantastic experience. We have a small video that we would like to play with here to demonstrate as to how we are working with government and how it is, uh, it is how that we are bring, able to bring the gap which is there in the digital learning across villages and the metro cities. Uh, we are trying to bridge that gap. Uh, may I have the video please? मिश्रा जी जी आज रोहन को स्कूल से एक घंटा लेट पिकअप करना है जी सर एक्स्ट्रा क्लास है याद है सर आपका बेटा बिरजू कौन सी क्लास में पढ़ता है वो जिस क्लास में रोहन बाबा है सर नाइन या ऑफ कोर्स क्या बनना चाहता है पता नहीं सर बड़ी बड़ी बातें करता है कुछ तो बड़ा करेगा पापा कहते हैं बिरजू बड़ा काम करेगा सर <laughs> आप बिरजू को अपने साथ शहर क्यों नहीं ले आते सर मेरे लिए गांव ही ठीक है सर बड़ा शहर मौके देता है जरा सोचिए हाँ बेटा या आई बॉट इट 
कल रोहन <laughs> चलो रोहन मिश्रा जी बॉक्स पड़ा है ना ये जी वन सेक थैंक यू इट्स ग्रफाइट तो फेवरेट लव यू बेटा बाय सर ये क्या है इसे टैबलेट कहते हैं खाने वाला नहीं है <laughs> और ये वो चीज है जो रोहन को बाकी बच्चों से आगे रखेगा Thank you. सर उस दिन अपने मौके के बारे में कहा था ना ये रहा मेरा बेटा बिरजू उसको भी सैमसंग टैबलेट मिला है सर अच्छा गवर्नमेंट ने उसके स्कूल के पूरे क्लास को दिया है सर क्या बात है ये कॉपर ऑक्साइड बनने के कारण होता है कॉपर ऑक्साइड कॉपर में ऑक्सीजन के योग से बनता है अब बिरजू भी टैबलेट से पढ़ने लगा है सर टेक्नोलॉजी से ही आएगी क्या सर इक्वालिटी इक्वालिटी हमें विश्वास है कि एक दिन देखते ही देखते हमारे समाज में जो दूरियां हैं वो मिट जाएंगी और इंडिया का हर स्टूडेंट हर बिरजू हर रोहन कंधे से कंधा मिलाकर आगे बढ़ेगा जब एक जैसा हो मौका तुम मिट जाएगा फासला जब एक जैसा हो मौका तो सब छू लेंगे आसमान तो सब छू लेंगे आसमान थैंक्स आकाश एनी एनीथिंग मोर यू वांट टू ऐड बिफोर वी गेट टू क्वेश्चंस या आई जस्ट वांट टू से दैट दिस इज दी टू समराइज इट दिस इज व्हाट सैमसंग इज ट्राइंग टू डू टू ब्रिज द गैप एंड the kind of opportunity that it is creating for the students is phenomenal and uh, it will only help overall the indian economy and establish as a very strong nation thank you great thank thanks panel so i'm just going to throw in one question before we put it out to the audience here um janet you were talking about how students set a very high bar for their user experience because they compare it with all the consumer stuff that's out there how how and i i put this to to everyone how does education keep pace with that because in consumer products you're microcharging you're changing things every day the ecosystem in education is more complicated with schools paying parents paying the people who are consuming are rarely the ones who pay so how can it be responsive and how can it how can the industry capture the value to invest to match the standard It's a very good and complex question I think and you know I genuinely believe that we are living in an exponentially changing world uh, and unfortunately sometimes in indus industries which are so large and complex they don't have the capacity necessarily to also grow that exponentially we we kind of grow at a linear pace until we get innovations and moments of you know inflection and i think this is a moment for all of us in the room to really look at the inflection opportunity of the industry um i think it's going to come in a few different ways i think the uh the accreditation piece is important we need to have institutions and schools uh prepared to accredit and understand that things will change under the surface you can have the same learning outcomes but the what's going on underneath can actually change rapidly so comfort with that change i think is going to be incredibly important um in terms of the actual user experience i think again this is where the co-design opportunity comes together uh, understanding what's happening in industry in learners pockets um in all of your on all of your devices and co-designing with educators and everybody uh, that's where there's a great chance for new industries to emerge maybe new edtech players as well 
Um, and then the decision makers, those of us who are leaders in our space, we have a really great chance here to make good decisions um, for the kinds of products we bring into our institutions, the kinds of things we put in front of our learners, uh, also the kinds of companies that we engage with and uh, you know, whether those are values aligned. So a couple of different things there. Um, thanks for the question. And Nick, you, you talked about getting that user experience right. How, how, have, how do you think you rise to that challenge of matching the pace of development that B2C consumer um, content can achieve? I think it's uh, in two areas, actually. Um, the first one, I mentioned it earlier, and, and I'm talking obviously from a, a technology platform perspective, right? The first, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, is um, the pedagogical styles and trends that are going on around the world and developing, and the styles, the pedagogical styles that faculty currently today use when they're delivering their classes in a in a face-to-face -face fashion. So I think I think first of all, if you're going to be up to date, and you're going to be right on the leading edge of technology from a learner's perspective you have to make sure that you're supporting the best possible pedagogical styles uh, in the world today to make sure that the faculty and the teacher is as enthusiastic about using the technology as a student is about learning from it. So that's, that's that side. Uh, from, a, from a learner's perspective, uh, the way we do it certainly is you know, we have what we call a continuous delivery model, which is that every month, and this of course is working with our, our partners here from AWS, but every month, every customer of ours around the world receives the latest version of our software. So the latest version of Brightspace is there for them every month. They don't have to do anything, it's there. It's cloud-based, it's there, okay. And that latest version will include a whole bunch of stuff, new features, maybe some fixes on some challenges we've had before, I mean, just a whole bunch of stuff. What we do is we make it our business to focus on every item that we build, whether it's a feature uh, or a small enhancement, we focus on the way in which the learner is going to use it and the fact that, as you quite rightly mentioned, you know, the, the usability of products has changed over time and the way in which a learner or any individual uses a device is changing and developing all the time. We absolutely make that our focus. It, it, it doesn't, it's like it doesn't go out of the door until it's got that stamp on it, right? And that's critical for us because if we're not at that leading edge, then the whole, I mean, our subject today this doesn't happen. Just um, following up on that, um, Sunil, do you, do you think that you, you know, part of a, a giant um, in, in the world of technology, do you think the giants, the, the AWSs, the Googles, are, are they wanting to own education technology? Or, or are, are you committed to it being a broader based ecosystem? So, so I, I'm going to contest that word giant. I don't think we really are, okay? We, we've been able to help a lot of customers, okay? And on the fundamental question, I want to just make the statement that I think teachers are very special, teachers across the world. I think teachers in India are very special, okay? I'll tell you why. Uh, in 2020, when the first time the lockdown happened in March, and the Delhi government was trying to figure out how you're going to continue schools, uh, in the government schools, right? And it's very difficult. Technology is not that easy to access. In 2020, it wasn't that easy. And we had a partner called Career Launcher that went ahead and supported the Delhi government to train 45,000 teachers over a two-week uh, time, time period, right? And just to learn how to use the computer, how to use online learning tools, et cetera. And in eight weeks' time, they managed to get 900,000 900, students online and continue with the learning process, okay? Now, why I'm bringing this up is that I think the pace of adoption of technology, the pace of innovation that's happening in education 
A large portion around works on the appetite of the teaching staff and the students working in, in, in continuity. And we're seeing that happening across board. I think uh, while we keep talking about India leapfrogging technology, leapfrogging learning models, etc., I think fundamentally there is this appetite that is there within the community right now to try and figure out the best way, most effective way to to teach and learn. And I think that's going to drive a lot of innovation. We're seeing that across the industry. We're going to see that accelerating as we go into next year and the years ahead. Great. Um, Akash, I'm, I'm on a roll with provocative questions now. Equality. Well, won't it always be the case that people like the guy in the back of the car with the money are going to be wanting to leapfrog their kids over um, what the state can offer poorer kids? Yeah, if you look at... Uh from a equality. Mic up to your mouth a bit more. Yeah, so I was saying from an equality perspective, uh, yes, uh, there is a transformation that happens, but uh, the most important thing, as some of us mentioned also, it has to be on uh, both the side, and the teachers have to be really enabled, uh, as uh, my friend from AWS spoke about. And uh, same thing as from the student side also. So both of them have to be at par to be able to really adopt technology. Because there are a lot of uh, situations and scenarios where we get into where uh, in certain areas or in certain pockets, teachers are not uh, uh, are adapting or adopting technology. And it becomes a challenge a big time. So it is very important for us to make sure that uh, we are working with them trying to highlight. So as a, a one of the technology uh, leaders, we work with government, we work with teachers, we work with student communities, and conduct a lot of sessions where we make sure that all of us understand the value that it adds, and that it truly is complementary to the physical education, so uh, physical offline education. And I'm glad that with all the investments that are happening today, a lot of online uh, education uh, technology companies are actually moving to offline as well and building a hybrid model. So it's very important to build those hybrid education models where there is an offline teaching as well as online. And the best part is this 24 by 7 facility that is now available to the students, which really helps in terms of uh, the growth which is there and anybody. And frankly, if you look at myself, uh, when I was in that class, I always know when I look at the kind of teaching aids that are available, you always feel I wish I was studying during this time because the kind of tools and technologies that are available, they really are a game changer. Thank Great. You. Let's um, throw it open to your questions now. So I, I saw a hand go up there really um, early. So let's, if we could get a mic um, to, the, to the chat there who ha who's actually got the got the face mask on right? but that was the fa that was the person that went went up quickest <laughs> oh, over there can we get my no I, i'm pointing to the person behind you that was that was the one i saw so let's um let's keep these questions short and provocative and stimulating for the best discussion so Thank guy you. next to you I, I i see i'm looking at him in the eye and i want him to ask it <laughs> go ahead sir Sir, good afternoon to all. I am a school principal in a city called Tirupati. On the one hand, it's praised and affirmed that teachers cannot replace digital resources. And uh, this is also appreciated by all the tech giant companies across the world. On the other hand, pre-pandemic, during pandemic, post-pandemic, new products are released by these companies, keeping in mind students as the end users. So we don't see any substantial contributions from these companies for the teachers. Why it's always only students? Because whether it is any phase of their learning, it's we teachers who have to take up the challenges. So keeping in mind this appreciation, are these tech giant companies, with due respect to them, contributing something to the teachers? Because children who are born in digital age, we call them as digital natives, there is a big gap between the digital natives and we, the digital immigrants. So how do you think that this gap can be bridged? And can there be any programs for the teachers or is there any thought process for the teachers from these companies so that we are always at the front? 
we don't panic in case if this cycle repeats. Okay, thank you. Great question. I'm going to throw it straight to Sunil. Um, teachers, why aren't their products there for them? Yeah, so, so uh, a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think there are plenty of tools in the market. See, I, I, digital natives, not necessarily the young ones. We all are digital natives now because of what's happened over the last couple of, couple of years. I think we saw a lot of educationists adopt technology over the last years to continue learning, right? For example, I don't know, many teachers, my wife's a teacher, and I saw the struggle to try and make content uh, with PPT to be broadcast on Zoom. It's very difficult for teachers to adopt new things suddenly. And given the time window that you had, it's very, very difficult, okay? But there are a lot of tools and a lot of companies now that are actually pro producing tools to make teaching and learning more effective in the classroom, okay? And you, you have to look for it. There are a lot of startups in, in the country right now that's focused on enabling tools in the classroom. Make sure that you can have effective learning, both online and offline. Okay, and like some, uh, Akash said about hybrid learning, right? And that's going to drive a lot of content consumption there. And we're seeing that content creation by teachers, there are plenty of tools available now in the market for you to actually build content. And you have great display technology to make the classroom more attractive than how it was earlier. I think the problem that we have today is the attention deficiency that you have in the classroom and the struggle to try and keep children to sit in the class and attend a full class, right? And I think the online world has kind of made the at entire attention timelines go further short. Kids want to get up and run away maybe less than two minutes sitting there. And I think that's the problem that looking at solving. So in fact, uh, there are a lot of providers now uh, that are offering a lot of solutions around trying to add quizzing in the classroom to make the entire interaction in the classroom more, more adaptive. The flipped classroom model that we spoke about in 20, 2018, 2019 is a reality now. We're seeing a lot of people actually practice that. Uh, supplemental learning, making sure kids have access to the content outside of office, outside of school hours, is, is, a, is a very much an effective model to try and make sure you continue doing that. So there is a lot of, there are a lot of solutions now in the market, both globally and in India, that teachers can dip into and try and make that classroom uh, a much more better experience for children. Thank you. Jeanette, you had a quick, quick thing to throw in as well, didn't you? Super quick. And I think um, it's a great question, but I think when we talk about tools and technology, sometimes we actually forget the human mindsets and the emotion and the hearts and minds that we need to bring along. And I think teachers do an incredible job of, of trying to keep up. But as I said before, you have so much on your plates, it's almost impossible to keep that little bit. So we often talk about skill sets, tool sets, and mindsets as well. And if there's any entrepreneurs in the audience, this could be an amazing entrepreneurship opportunity, a startup opportunity to support teachers, to maybe be a digital help desk for teachers, as well as emotional support as people have to adapt quickly. So I think it's a really great question and what an opportunity to address. Okay, next question, please. Um, I'm looking, looking out there. Um, let's go for this lady right at the front here. You've got a mic near you already. Sir. I'm from Kerala and the principal of a, a government school where I have 75% of students belongs to financially as well as educationally back, uh, backward uh, minority. Sir, the, I'm talking to the Samsung authority. Sir, we are very thankful to you because, sir, the video was really heartbreaking. We are all uh, working for the equality and thank you for being with us. Thank you, thank you. Do, you. do you have a question in there as well, or just a comment of, <laughs> no. of thanks? Sir, this is only a word of thanks. Fantastic, thank <laughs> Thanks you. for giving opportunity, because we are all working for the equality, because most of the delegates are from private schools, sir, here, mm -hmm. I think, because we are from a government school, so we are all working for this. Uh, backward minority, sir. So, okay. <laughs> thank Great. you. Thank, thank, thank you. you once again. Let's take a question there from the gen gentleman behind you, just standing up there. The mic's coming to you now, sir. Hi. I'm Yasser from Kerala. I work with uh, multiple institutions in Kerala, and I do digital transformation. And uh, I have uh, experience in EduTech as well for the last... Uh, 13 years I was working with d 2 I have done deployment on-premise in Qatar. So my question is, uh, we have recently heard uh, some bad 
remarks about one of the uh, leading edge tech or LMS platform. So is, uh, it's about uh, the quality of the content they have provided, I believe, because of that they have, uh, uh, they are falling down. So is there any governing body for monitoring such uh, uh, degradation of uh, quality of uh, such learning platforms? Thank you. Thank you, sir. So that's a question about um, the content that sits on learning platforms, not just the platform itself. Nick, how, how do we get the richness of content out there for you know, someone from Kerala, someone from Punjab, someone from Australia? No, it's a, and it's a great question, and it's the question that any, any institution uh, anywhere in the world who's starting up with an education technology platform will ask. They're actually not so worried about the platform at that point. They're more worried about their content and how they create it, develop it, get it up, etc. I ran a fully online business school in Singapore for five years, and if somebody said to me, and, and our content was created by some great SMEs and great universities around the world, and if, uh, if somebody said to me, and this is fully online, by the way, if somebody said to me, which is the most important part of what you do, is it your platform or is it the content? And my answer automatically was going to be the content. That's what my students are learning, right? But there has to be a great learning platform to be able to deliver it and enhance it. So really, in my opinion, there are kind of three ways in which you look at content. One is if you already have some kind of a platform, you've built some content and you're moving to a, a better platform, more sophisticated, more features, whatever it happens to be, then obviously the migration of that content uh, and, the, uh, and the fact that you want to keep that content as it is but use the new tools that sit in the new platform to enhance it is critical. Second is, if you have no content or you have no platform but you have content, if the content you have is what you're delivering face-to-face, -face, traditionally maybe it's in PDF or PowerPoint, it's in your mind, you've been doing it for the last 20 years, you, you have a particular style of delivering as a teacher, then how, how, do, you, how do you transfer that to a digital platform? That's, that's a key. So, you know, there are great people around the world called instructional learning designers, uh, very talented people who can, who can understand from an academic perspective how you want to deliver that, and then understand from a technology platform perspective, or a technology perspective, how you marry the two and put it onto the platform. But the other part of it is, you need to make sure that the platform has the tools available to enable you as a teacher to easily start using it, to take what you've got, create a course, add a couple of tools, and then start delivering it. To do it quickly and simply and easily. And then as you go through time and you understand the richness of the other tools that sit on the platform, then you can add those and make the content more sophisticated in your delivery. And the third way, of course, is you get the right third-party content from somewhere that you've identified a content provider and bring it into the platform. So the key there is to make sure that your technology platform is open. In other words, it has the ability to connect and bring in content from any provider. So providing you've got the right platform and you've got the right strategy, then content, uh, because it's so important, is something that can become a relatively easy thing to get involved in. We've got time for one last question, I'm afraid. The time goes very fast on these things. Um, I'm going to go to a, a little bit towards the back, this gentleman here. Sorry to everyone else who's had a hand up and we haven't had time. Just, no, just behind you there. Sorry for everyone who hasn't had a chance to ha have their uh, question. Good today. afternoon, all the dignitaries on the dais. Myself, Atish. Uh, I am from Secular Education Trust Principal of uh, Goregao Raigad, Maharashtra. So my question is to all the dignitaries over here that as we all know that actually we have affected from the pandemic and it has just, it was a sudden challenge for all the teachers just to start with this sudden like uh, for uh, being online and actually it was a great challenge. The thing is that what uh, the problems our teachers are facing as we are from the remote areas, 
directly the level of the student actually it has the the student was in first standard it has gone to the level of fourth but uh, the level and the syllabi has uh, just changed but the mentality otherwise the iq level is uh, of this particular student is in the same of that standard first so how the government otherwise how the all the companies are going to work on the basic uh, knowledge of the students because suddenly the syllabus has changed and the students are facing a lot of problems and even these teachers have to go with the same syllabus now as the student le iq level otherwise their knowledge has not yet increased that so how it will be increasing so how how do we deal with um, those gaps in knowledge um, and skills, particularly around how they use the, the digital content. Akash, can I throw that to you? See, at times, uh, I'll give you a classic example that we faced recently. Uh, we supplied these uh, devices in one of the states, uh, several hundred thousand devices, and we found that uh, the devices, were, the teachers and the students were not able to use those devices. And we actually went on the ground and uh, our teams went into multiple schools trying to figure out as to what is happening, where is the gap. And we realized that a lot of uh, teachers were not able to use the devices, they didn't know how to use them as well as uh, the way they were communicating. So what we did was, and in fact there was one of the questions as to uh, what are these companies doing for teachers, so I would like to say that uh, out there we went ahead and proactively, although it was not part of our, uh, so to say, statement of work, but we went ahead and uh, we are continuously conducting multiple trainings for the teachers on the usage of the device and the software solutions that the government has developed along with other ecosystem partners. At the same time, we are training the students also to, as to how the device has to be used so that uh, teachers and students both are able to figure out uh, the right usage of the device. So yes, there is a lot that needs to be done and uh, I think this is a continuous evolving process where uh, we all have to contribute towards making sure that the teachers and the students are able to pick up and get onto the technology uh, wagon out there. Great, thanks Akash. We're out of time I'm afraid. Um, fascinating session, I, what I took from it was that the importance of the physical technology, the platform and the content and how they all work together is critical in meeting the needs of digital natives. I think another thing that was very refreshing to hear from this panel was just how important teachers are in this process and how important the face-to-face -face element of schooling is and how that can best be integrated with digital as it as it continues to evolve. I think a few years back a panel like this we might have we might have felt teachers were going to be out of a job and I think we all know teachers are what it's all about um, and I think we heard that from everyone today. So put your hands together please for our, our guests Jeanette Chia, Sunil Acharya, Nick Hutton and Akash Saxena. <laughs>